Greetings. My name is Guy Dauncey and this is the show Change the World on Spotlight. And today I have as my guest a young man who ran for council initially at the age of 18 and got elected at the age of 19. Ned Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. And I wanted you to be here as a role model for young people to show that you can get right involved at a young age. So as, as well as being now a Saanich councillor, you, before all this, you were secretary of the Mount Ptolemy Community Association. You were the youth rep on the Arts, Culture and Heritage Advisory Committee, on the youth rep on the Environment and Natural Areas Advisory Committee, founder of a 60,000 strong petition to ban caged chicken confinement in the BC's egg industry, and a two-time head shaver for Cops for Cancer. That's right. So yeah. you, while still at school, were pretty busy doing a bunch of stuff and finishing school, I presume, right? That's right, yeah. No, during my last uh, few years at high school, I was fairly involved and, and interested in politics, so. So did your fellow schoolmates think you were super cool or super nerdy? A bit of both. Uh, I know that uh, <laughs> I did it in my grad year, I actually got voted uh, the most likely to replace Trudeau. Uh, so, uh, so I'm still working on that. But the most like of your class or of their, everyone in Canada? Uh, of the class. Of the class. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a couple of years to get on with that one, right? Yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so what drew you to think that politics would be an interesting realm to work in? You know, uh, people ask me that question. It's, it's sort of difficult for me to answer why I love politics so yeah. much, but I think it's because of uh, you know, the, just how big of an impact it has on, on really everything that we yeah. do uh, and, and our, our future. Uh, and you know, I, when, I, when I first started learning about it, it was actually in the 2015 uh, federal election. I thought that was a really exciting uh, election because I had the chance to you know, really make history in a sense. That's when we changed from Harper to that's Trudeau. Right, that's yes. right. So we had a, you know, a long-standing conservative prime minister yeah. of 10 years. Uh, and, uh, and you know, I was really interested in that. And that was when it sort of sparked for me my interest. And then after the election was over, I did some volunteering yeah. and things like that right. during the election. But after that, I wanted to keep learning more and, and, and get more involved. So, so were you doing door knocking during that election? I was, yeah. I did some door knocking for different candidates and then also just, uh, you know, watch the news and, and watch the debates and stayed yeah. informed and talked with my family and friends about it and just yeah. sort of did, uh, got involved as much as I could at that point while still yeah. in school. Would you have liked to have had the vote when you were 16? I, I would have, yeah. And I actually I did advocate for that quite a bit when I was 16 and 17. Yes. And one of the things that I often said, uh, and I actually, you know, I actually spoke to the um, the parliamentary committee on electoral reform when yeah. when uh, when that committee was underway, considering proportional representation, yeah. those sorts of things. And I said to them, you know, if I'm 17 years old and I can join the military and fight and die yeah. for my country, why can't I vote for who's running yeah. my country? Well, uh, I've been a champion for votes at 16, and it's a very practical reason as well, because if when you, when you leave school, you haven't yet voted, and you, you leave school, you enter a few years when you're trying to be super cool, and you don't want to do what adults do, and adults vote into politics, so we won't right. do that, and you get in the habit of not voting. Well, yeah, if yeah. your first election is while you're at school, yeah. and you've got in the habit of voting, you're going to continue that habit and that understanding of politics, that's from right. the age of 16 onwards, which makes a lot of sense to me. And it's perfect timing, really, because that is the time when we're in social studies learning about yeah. the, the, the basics uh, and the foundations of our political system and right. our political history. So it's really a perfect time for right. young people to be able to engage in the subjects that they're learning yeah. about with a vote. So now we've got Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish right. girl, who is actively having a climate strike mm -hmm. once a week. And she's got t people saying, oh, you shouldn't go on, you're playing truant. And she's saying back to them, you have been playing truant with the climate That's for right. the last 30 years. Right, yeah. She's so engaged. And to think that, oh, well, you're not allowed to vote. I mean, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we really do have to listen to, to what young people yeah. are telling us. And what they're telling us loud and, loud and clear is that we have to take action on issues like climate right. change. And I think being able to engage them and give them that vote uh, is just, you know, uh, another step in the yeah. right direction. So um, when you were campaigning, obviously only people over 18 could, mm -hmm. could vote, That's but right. did you find it easy to engage with other young people during the campaigning? Uh, you know, it, there was at times were difficulties, but it, I, I did get a lot of uh, support from the, the young people in my class yeah. uh, at, at, at school and, and whatnot. And I did do a lot of campaigning actually at the university and, and, yeah. and Camosun campus. Uh, and I was actually quite pleasantly surprised at just how many people had said they already had voted in the advance right. polls or were planning to yeah. vote. So I think there, there was a bit of a shift this election, at least in the municipal yeah. election, just yeah. how many young people were getting so then, out to vote. So last October was it, you, you, you get elected, congratulations, right. Thank you. and suddenly you're sitting in these council meetings. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the experience like for a first timer of your age being thrown into that system? It's, uh, it's fairly surreal. I mean, you know, I, I spent a lot of time 
uh, in those council chambers sitting in the audience. Um, yes. Right through, uh, so you know, you've seen it. I've, from, that's from right. Party. That's right. Since uh, since I first got involved in in in, uh, in running for office yes. at, at the Saanich Council level, and and so to be actually be sitting, uh, you know, in a in a seat at the council table, it was yes. quite um, surreal, and then even more so to sit at the CRD board table as well. So right. you know, it's uh, it's it was a bit hard to believe it at first. Now I'm. Feel like I'm not. I don't want to say getting used to it, but yeah. uh, getting into the groove a bit more. And, and now I'm starting to get to the point where I'm able to move motions and, and, and right. change some things. And so, as well as sitting on Saanich Council, you get a seat on the CRD board as well. So, that's, that's right. how's that? Yeah, well, it's really quite interesting. You know, the regional government takes on a lot of big issues: mm -hmm. recycling, uh, water supply, transportation. Yep, transportation, sewage is obviously one yeah. that uh, people hear about quite a bit. So, uh, you know, I find the regional government very interesting, very eye-opening, actually, because yes. you're seeing so many different perspectives on a board of 24 directors. Yeah. So, my experience of this is that to the extent that you have not done your homework, the opinions of staff are going to dominate. And if you have done your homework, then you can level up with staff and say, and answer, say I think this, and discuss stuff with them. Is that true? Well, sure. And it's also, you know, staff have a lot of very, uh, you know, good advice, and they have professional expertise yes. that, that I don't have. Yes. So, you know, I'm very keen on uh, being able to have the opportunity to listen to that and to hear yeah. their advice. But also, you know, I want to make sure that my opinions are being heard right. and that I'm uh, you know, uh, you know, taking my stance uh, on, on whatever issue it may be. So, so if, let's do a little brain experiment. If you were mayor and you had five supportive councillors and a very supportive community for your top three goals for Saanich, what would you really like to achieve if you had all those things working in your favor? Well, you know, politicians don't like hypotheticals. But uh, what I've got to have vision. Politicians sure, have sure, to have vision sure. of what you but want. What I, what I will say is that uh, I think uh, you know, during the election campaign, I did talk a lot about some sort of three or four okay. big issues. So, uh, firstly, obviously, a big issue is affordable housing. Yes. Uh, that's really big. Transportation is another key issue. And I bring, I think, a bit of a bit different perspective to that uh, at the council table because I'm someone who does not own a car. Right. You know, I use uh, public transit and bike lanes and things like that to, okay. to get around the city. And it can be really difficult to do that sometimes. Yes. And then, you know, so another big issue, of course, is climate change and, yes. and, and protection of the environment. Right. And then one thing that sort of ties into all of that is, uh, you know, fiscal responsibility and, and budgeting. And I, you know, I think one of the sort, you know, principles that I've had, and, and going through my first budget yeah. process at Senate, just being really interesting. I think we absolutely have to be able to take big steps and big initiatives, yeah. but also ensure that our budget uh, is under control and, and that we're taking care of our taxpayer dollars. Yeah. So on the affordable housing crisis, and I'm super aware of that, just as background, 20 years, well, tw back in the 1970s, mm -hmm. young people had to, in five years, you could save to get a deposit. Yeah. Now you need 20 years to save to get a deposit. Yeah. So people of my age sometimes say, well, I had to work hard when I was young, what's there, they're just whining, and it's totally not true. There's a yeah. huge difference in the yeah. struggle that your generation has Absolutely. to get housing. Is Saanich making some really good progress on getting affordable housing within Saanich? Because when I lived there, it all seemed comfortable middle class. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. I, I think we are making some some big steps. There is, of course, there's always more that we could do. Yes. But the housing issue is really tough. You know, there's no silver bullet. Some of the things that we are doing to address yeah. it is we're looking at legalizing garden suites, yes. uh, which are de detached rental suites, yeah. say a separate, uh, you know, yep. little Absolutely. suite in someone's backyard. Right yeah. now, those are illegal. And I, I pushed uh, a lot for those to be legalized during the election campaign. And yeah. so now looking forward to... People have been talking about legalizing, legalizing garden suites yeah. for a long time. Probably too long, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, you know, we did a, a year-long study on it and spent, uh, you know, uh, I think it was around thirty-five thousand yes. dollars to do that. And I think public engagement is great. Yeah. Um, I, I think we probably could have legalized it, um, you know, before doing that study. We know that this is a housing crisis, yes. you know, not just a housing inconvenience. Right. Um, but we're at the stage now where the study is about to be completed, and we're going to be hopefully looking forward to legalizing those. And then uh, we're also yeah. trying to engage the public with things like yeah. a housing forum uh, and whatnot too. It's not just about having more housing housing, which goes mm -hmm. on at market price, mm. it's housing for people on low incomes That's who right. are, are struggling and the, and the rents right. are getting so unbelievably high as well. That's right. And we also need diversity of housing. Yeah. Uh, you know, not everybody lo is looking for the same thing. That's you know, right. we need housing yeah. for students. We yes. need housing for seniors. And, yeah. uh, we need housing for families. We need three yes. bedrooms yeah. uh, so that yeah. people can raise a family here in Saanich yeah. and, and in the CRD. So, right. uh, you know, we, I think when you look at different areas of Saanich, Saanich is very diverse. Uh, you've got some higher density areas like Uptown where we can put those, yeah. uh, those bigger projects. And then we've yeah. got our residential areas like Gordon Head where I live, where we can have garden suites and that sort of reasonable 
reasonable residential so, infill. So what about the idea that Victoria has been discussing that every development project must be one third affordable housing? I think that's, uh, you know, that's a big step. Uh, I, I'm going to be interested to see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, again, I think we have to focus on ensuring that we're working with developers, yes. uh, you know, not having a, a good working relationship yeah. with them, and then also making sure that development applications can, you know, get to council at a reasonable point in time, yeah. and then, of course, ensuring that public input yes. and community consultation, the neighborhood input of, that are going to be affected by those so, developments, so are going to be at front and center. So, if a, if a developer made the commitment, you got a picture a ranked level that will be at the third rental, you'll say, okay, we'll get you approved in six months. Mm -hmm. If we say a quarter, it's going to take a year. If you make no commitment, it might take three years. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. Would, might maybe an incentive for them. Th that could be, but you see, right now, most development applica applications can take even two or three years to get well, to I council know, so. on a regular basis. So that's yes. that's a really big issue in itself. Right. So I and I think we have to focus on getting development applications to council at a bit of a more efficient time, because, like I said, this is a housing crisis, not just an inconvenience. What I'm suggesting is, because developer the, the time delays matter to them, because they've yeah. put the money down. They bought the land. That's right. They borrowed money. They're paying That's interest right. on it. That could be leverage as persuasion to them that sure. you'll get quicker approval. Sure if you meet these four points. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. And I think that's something that we need to consider. But of course, right now, um, you know, we're at the point where we're not even able to get any uh, applications, so to speak, in, in to council in, you know, six months or, or less than a year. So I, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we absolutely have to address. And, and we're, yeah. we're at pretty early stages in addressing that right now. Mm. So, you know, I think it's a, a good idea. Yeah. But I want to make sure that we're making, you know, the first steps, right. uh, you know, in place in order to be able to do something like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. So uh, the climate crisis thing, yes. the, the, the term climate emergency has been used in the last three or four months. That's right. As yeah, I believe has. it absolutely should be. Absolutely. How is Sanich responding to that? So uh, I originally brought a motion to the CRD board with Mayor Lisa Helps and, and uh, Victoria Mayor Lisa Helps yes. and then Souk Mayor uh, Maya Tate to declare a climate emergency, A, and then yes. B, uh, commit to working towards being a carbon neutral region by 2030. And I was really pleased to have that pass unanimously at the board. And then part of that motion was to have that motion then drop down to all 13 municipalities in the CRD. Well, I was really pleased when I saw that. And yeah. I know that you're, you've got Vancouver, San Francisco, right. the whole city of London yeah. is on board with this. Yeah. And furthermore, in Britain, the, the entire Labour Party may be about to announce a climate emergency. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole, and the head of the, would, the Scottish, um, I can't, the Scottish, Scottish God government, yeah. Nicola Sturgeon, she yeah. said the whole of Scotland will aim for this. Yeah. So between climate, the current Saanich plan is 50% mm. reduction in emissions by 2050. Yeah. That's a big difference from it basically 100% by 2030. It is, yeah, and I, th and I you know, I th it's a, it's a big step. It's ambitious, yeah. but I think it's necessary. And you know, this, this is, this I, is really. I agree completely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's easy. 2050 is like, it's somewhere else there. It's someone yes. else's responsibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even when the, British, when the BC government said that all new vehicles must be electric mm -hmm. by 2040, I think. Mm -hmm. Why wait till 2040? Oh, I know. The I price know. competitiveness is coming on right now. Absolutely. The new cars this year will have a 400 kilometer range. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we really don't have time to, yeah. to wait. And again, you know, people have questioned whether or not we are actually able to become a carbon neutral region by 2030. But yeah. uh, I think we absolutely have to try. So my response to that, because I've been in the climate change field for so long, mm -hmm. is that when in 1961, President Kennedy said, we're going to land a man on the moon by, by the end of this decade. Yeah. No one in NASA knew how to do it. That's right. That's right. They just said, we're going to do our utmost. That's we're going right. to do whatever it takes. That's right. And you, you can't prove out in advance every single step. But yeah. if there are 50 things we have to do, 30 of them we know how to do right now. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. We, we absolutely, it's a, it's a perfect example, really, because, yeah. you know, we might not have no all the pieces that we have yeah. to put in place in order to do that. Uh, but we can make some first steps and we absolutely have to, to set a target yeah. uh, and, and try. And we, we've heard from the IPCC report that yeah. uh, this is what we have to do uh, in order to, 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 to address this issue, in order pr to protect yeah. uh, our Earth for, you know, for my generation and for future generations. I have a saying around the climate crisis that if, if you think you've understood the climate change and you haven't had that awful sinking feeling in your belly, you haven't understood it. Yeah. Because when you yeah. really dig in, you think, oh, my God, this is really serious. Very serious. Absolutely. And if we have this much a challenge to turn Saanich or Victoria around, think of is 
Afghanistan and Kazakhstan and Russia, all the other countries have also got to do it. Absolutely. It's, it's uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't just do it on our own. We need uh, all local governments, all provincial governments. So that's the leadership. So some people argue, oh, Canada's only 2%. What's the point in trying? Mm. If you, if you in, say, back to the World War II analogy, if every soldier would be soldier, mm -hmm. saying, well, I'm just one soldier. What can I do? Mm. We would have had no army at all. Mm -hmm. And Hitler would have had free reign, right? Sure. And so if, if Saanich and Victoria <coughs> and Souk and the Highlands can show that leadership, yeah, exactly. everyone else say, look, they're doing it. It gives, it gives encouragement to everyone else. Exactly. And so what are the key issues that need to be worked on to get to that 2030 goal? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's a number of things. I think, again, transportation is a really yeah, big it's, issue. It's, what, 60, when, 70 percent of the emissions? Yeah, right? it's a really big issue when we talk about emission reductions in our region alone. Yes. Uh, you know, I think we need better public transit. I think we need bike lanes and sidewalks that are connected throughout the region, not just starting and stopping, because we yes. want people to be able to get from A to B, get yeah. from uh, work to their house or their house to their local neighborhood yeah. center to their amenities so that they're actually encouraged to walk, bike or catch a bus so what rather I saw than in, getting in a what car. What I've seen in Europe is the real key for the cycling breakthrough is the safe separated bike lane. Mm. I mean, yeah. Simon Whitfield, who's one of our Olympic champions, he was cycling. This truck comes along, you know, mirrors that big wide, knocks him yeah. off his bike. Yeah. We know that the, the going home in commuter hours, people are doing the 70 and the 50 zones yeah. and they've got the big fat mirrors. Yeah. And it, the separation makes a big difference. It does, it does. And you know, we, we, we've seen that happen in the city of Victoria where we're gonna be doing those sorts of things in Saanich yeah. as well. What, Shelburne Street yes. uh, is one example of a real key corridor yes. uh, in Saanich uh, that we're gonna be putting bike lanes, separated bike yeah. lanes on both sides of the street right. uh, and, and new sidewalks as well. So yeah. that's a perfect example of what we yeah. need to be doing. And I mean, electric buses are, are doable. They, they, Absolutely. they cost a bit more. Yeah. to buy, they cost much less to run, they pay for themselves in the 12-year life. Well, exactly, and then that's again links back to one of the issues that I talked about earlier in this interview is yeah. uh, you know, fiscal responsibility. You know, yeah. In the end, these actually save us money yeah, in the long run. In fact, the study coming out of, um, I forget which authority it was, just in the last two weeks said because of the falling price of renewables, mm -hmm. um, which is less of an issue for us because our electricity is all renewable already, mm -hmm. There's a multi-trillion dollar saving to the world by acting on climate change because the new yeah. energy forms, wind and solar in particular, are so much cheaper than any other forms of energy, right? Yeah. So yeah. it really builds the economy as we do this green transition. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all, it's all intertwined and there's often, again, lots of yeah. positive economic and fiscal impacts that we can have from, from tackling climate change right. head on. So have you, been, have you been on an electric bike? Uh, I, you know, I think I have. It's I, I, I use. know if you have. I, I, I'm, you know, honestly, I'm not sure, but I, I've done a lot of biking just so, on a regular yeah, bike myself. Because for some people to say, well, I'm too old to bike, or whatever. Yeah. Go to a bike shop, ask yeah. to trial a road electric bike. Yeah. Go to the bottom of a hill. It's just pedaling along. Yeah. Come to the hill, and you turn on the electric drive. You, yeah. you, you sail up that hill yeah. without any muscle pain and yeah. you're not out of breath and it's oh my god that's really transformative well, you destroy gravity <laughs> yeah well you know honestly i used to do a lot of uh, road cycling as a sport so i yeah. I, I i quite like the the pain of going up well, a, a long same, hill on a bike but most people don't want to be sports well, road cyclists enough. yeah fair enough when you look at the photographs of amsterdam and they're all pedaling along yeah. quietly without even because it's so safe they don't even need helmets so most people don't want to uh, be the yeah. super aggressive road well, cyclists. Well I'd never say it's so safe that you don't need helmets but I right. would say that uh, you know electric bikes absolutely are yeah. a way to get people who uh, you know on a bike who, yeah. who usually wouldn't be comfortable or, or yeah. who wouldn't enjoy that. And then electric cars. Yeah yeah exactly and electric buses and all those sorts of Is things. Is working on the infrastructure for charging electric cars? We are and, and you know one of the things that I've tried to do as a councillor is when we see development applications come forward yeah. uh, developers will often uh, you know listen to the input the councillors have yes. and I've, I've spoken up a couple of times and said you know do you have any electric vehicle charging stations and sometimes they'll say no and I'll say well that's something that's important to me and then oftentimes they'll come back at our public hearing uh, and, right. and see that change made but, in their proposal. But shouldn't that be on the application list that is mandatory? Well, you know, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, I think if the council shows the development community that this is a really important priority for yes. them, and not only that, but when you see new homes being built, having solar-ready homes and these sorts yeah. of things, uh, when, we, when we show to the development community that that's important to us, right. they're going to be taking the lead on their own uh, to put these kinds of initiatives forward. Yeah. The role of farming and forestry with regard to climate, where do they fit in? Uh, sorry, could you say that The role of farming, farmland and farming, forestry yeah, for, for sequestrating, yeah. storing the carbon. So protecting yeah. farmland, 
Absolutely, protecting farmland, not only protecting farmland, but getting farmland into use yes. uh, is really key. And you know, we've got uh, you know a good amount of farmland here in Sanch, and we've been able to uh, protect it with a, a number of tools, such as the urban containment boundary. Yes. Uh, yes. Another uh, area is the Blankensop Valley, yes. uh, which is uh, you know a real gem. Uh, and you know, we we have to absolutely ensure that you know farmland is protected, uh, but yes. not just protected and unused. We want to make sure that farmland is getting into use, uh, so that we can you know support more uh, local food. If it's in the ALR, it's got that protection, agricultural land reserve. That's right. But you've got some farm that's zoned agricultural, but it's not in the land reserve. Exactly. Yeah. So, so some of that can be vulnerable to a development proposal. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So then you need to really work closely to protect it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And local food growing. I mean, we have three days food supply on the island and we're shipping in the food, yeah. burning fossil fuels to get it all the time. I know, I know. It's really unfortunate because, you know, all of the, the emissions, the transportation that it takes to yeah. get food here from other parts of the world, we can be growing a lot of it here ourselves. So let me throw you a, a confusing or controversial idea. Farmers who, farm with farmland, yeah. who earns, I think it's around $5,000 a year in income, yeah. gets a tax break, yeah. right? A lot of those farmers are growing hay which is yeah. sold to the horsey people who've got no shortage of income because it costs a lot of money to raise yeah. horses. Yeah. Why are we subsidizing people with horses with cheap hay on farms that are not growing food? You know, it's a good question. <laughs> it's to be honest with you, it's the one I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I imagine uh, that that would be a bit more, would it be provincial? I think it's provincial policy, yeah, yeah it's not within yeah, your realm. But I would, yeah. my wife's very keen on this one, Carolyn Herriot, who wrote, did a lot of yeah. stuff on food. And she's saying, well, you shouldn't really be getting that tax break unless you're growing food. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's a reasonable point. Uh, and again, you know, we want to be encouraging people who have yeah. farmland and, 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 you know, rural land uh, yeah. to be getting that farmland into use uh, to, for, food, for, for food production. Yeah. I mean, yeah. during the World, World War, in the past, everyone was growing food at home because it was out or starve because yeah. the food coming from America was being U-bombed by the German <laughs> submarines, right? That's right, that's right. And I wonder whether we live in such a beautiful area, complacency of comfort undermines the need for urgent action to address emergency? You know, I, I, I think so, and I don't think uh, everybody understands just how urgent and pressing yeah. this issue is. Uh, and I think that's I, think like, I agree with you on that one. Yeah, yeah, I think we, you know, we need to make sure that education and awareness is something that's also yes. front and center of our, our, our plans for climate change. We yeah. want to make sure. Have the, have the children who are doing the, the school children doing the climate strike, have they come to speak to council? Uh, I, I, we, we, I remember that when I brought my climate ch change emergency motion to the CRD, we yes. had a number of children, actually, right. young people, uh, yeah. come speak to the CRD board. Uh, and I had so much respect for those people yeah. because, you know, it's a, it's a nerve-wracking thing to speak to a board of 24 politicians. Yes. And they came uh, and spoke confidently uh, and passionately uh, yeah. about supporting my motion and doing much more to address climate change. Yeah. And how did the, what was the vote for your motion in the end? Uh, it was unanimous, 24 to 0. Yeah. So Stu Young from Langford, and all the, the, he supported it well, too. Stu Young's not on the CRD okay. board. He sends two councillors from Langford, and they, they both supported well, it as well. Right. Yeah. Have the, did the, the councillors on the CRD board really register what it meant to go for carbon neutral by 2030? I think so, yeah. And just to define for viewers what carbon neutral means? So carbon neutral is, uh, you know, it's it, one ex good example, I guess, is perhaps, uh, you know, a fire. Uh, you know, it may uh, be producing emissions, yes. uh, but it's, it's a bit of a carbon neutral thing because, uh, of course, uh, wood is coming from a tree that yes. sucked emissions right. uh, out of the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, so, so that's where we're trying to go. And I don't want to, people to think that we're just going to be buying offsets yeah, somewhere else uh, and then still producing emissions on our own. Yes. That's not at all right. uh, what we want to do. We want to be reducing our emissions. And we can be doing things yeah. like planting trees here in the CRD yes. uh, to, you know, to, to offset those emissions. And protecting emissions. existing trees. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, right. yeah. So I, I think that when we get to 2020, the sense that this is the critical decade and things, mm -hmm. so many things, are, I mean, we've already seen the price of, you know, electric vehicles falling steadily, the price of batteries falling steadily, the range increasing. Yeah. There's got to be some critical change. I mean, I think the, the fact that we're having August, yeah. when the sky is yellow and the sun is mm -hmm. this weird thing up there because of all the smoke from the forest fires, well, making people, right. this is serious. Well, it is, and you know we're starting to see these effects right here in our, you know, in our own community. Yeah. Uh, the impacts of climate change. You know, we're starting to see, like I said, like you said, uh, yeah. the wildfires. We're yeah. starting to see even uh, more shortages of waters in our reservoirs yeah. here in the region. So we're seeing these impacts yeah. right here in our own community. So, what's your connection with other young people? Because the young people's voice, you've got 
I'm going to be gone in 30 years. Yeah. That's, that 30, it's going to be a very ter yeah. stormy 30 years anyway, but you've yeah. got 70 years ahead of you, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, I think uh, you see, uh, I think you're starting to see a lot more young people get involved yes. uh, because I think they're really starting to realize that this is their future on the line. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're seeing uh, so many students uh, in the region at UVic uh, or Camosun uh, get organized and get involved. Yeah. And again, you know, we're seeing people come to, to council meetings and to CRD yeah. meetings and speak to us about the importance so of this Sanich, issue. Saanich has its um, pension funds and stuff like that. Have they talk, discussed divesting their funds from fossil fuel investments? Uh, pension funds? Well, and, and Saanich must have a bank account. Of and course. it must be stored in we banks somewhere. It's invested somewhere, number, right? Yeah. Do that. Have those in this discussion about divesting from fossil fuels taken place? So you're, you're not investing those same funds in oil and gas. Well, yeah, we're we're starting to make that transition now. So okay. of course, you know, when uh, we have a number of vehicles, fleet vehicles that we use for yeah. public works or infrastructure yeah. and all sorts of things, and we're trying to uh, transition yeah. those away now from yeah. gasoline powered on, on vehicles the financial side. and towards to electric yeah. vehicles. So I mean, that, that, there's a cost to that. So I think that's yeah. financially related. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we're 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 trying to stop spending money on things that are, yes. of course. Uh, supporting no, no, fossil what I, fuels. What I'm getting at okay. is when, when you have bank accounts storing money, that sure. money is banked somewhere and it's being invested oh, somewhere. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and I those investments, half the time, they're with oil companies and they're with gas right, companies. So right. they're, they're expanding the use of fossil fuels. So we need right. to change our investments. Oh, I see where you're getting at. Yeah, no, that's a really, that's a, that's a good point. I, I'm honestly, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but that would be a good question that I could, yeah. that I could ask has a staff. big divestment campaign. There's so many things yeah. to think about. I, it, it's, it's a very complex issue and it's yeah. all intertwined. So, so what yeah. time do you wake up in the morning thinking all this stuff, right? Well, you know, different times uh, every day. Sometimes I wake <laughs> up quite early. Sometimes I'm going to bed quite late because our council meetings are going past midnight and we wow. had one yeah. last night that, that uh, hit the midnight mark. So, yeah. so it's, uh, it's a, it's a bit of a different schedule. It's not nine yes. to five. It's it's all over the map, yeah, but sure. but it's really exciting and I quite enjoy it. Well, look, congratulations oh, for thank you. being elected, for thank you. holding the thought together and taking leadership on these critically important issues. So yeah. it's, 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 I'm glad to have you on the show so you can show other young people that if you're 18 years old and you're thinking about politics, you can run and get elected too. You know, there's a federal election coming up this, this fall. That's right. So anyway, this has been the show called Change the World. My name is Guy Dauncey. Um, one of my small contributions is this, this book that I've written called Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible, set in Vancouver in the year 2032, which showcases a whole whack of, of the kind of positive ideas we're talking about and shows that this stuff, though it is possible, we have to make this stuff happen. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure, yeah. Guy. Thanks yeah. for having yeah. me. Okay.